uploaded that, and I want to encourage you to, to go check that out. Now, I'm taking a lot more time than I should here, right here, right now, on this, but this is an important enough because I believe that more than just us saying we went to church, we need to understand that the goal is never just that we went to church. The goal is that we experience the presence of God. And that presence of God changed us to be different, to live different out in our world. And if there's anything that this world is lacking, it's joy. In his presence is fullness of joy. Well, how do we get into his presence? I know theologically we go, well, he is, he's, uh, you know, he's all, always, ever present. You're correct, but are we aware of the gifts or his uh, characteristic or what he's wanting to impart to us throughout that time? So it's not about a church building and it's not about a song or a song set. It's about being aware that in his presence there is fullness of fullness, fullness of joy. Now listen, okay, you can celebrate that. That's good. I don't want to squelch you on that, but here, here's the deal. Some of us, we aren't, we are allowing the presence of our circumstances to rob us of our joy. Some of you have been experiencing some physical challenges. Right before service, as a volunteer team, we came together and we were praying. And I grabbed Brother Jason's hand, the one that was up here with, with, with Michaela, and, and they were giving some of the information. And I grabbed his hand. He was sit, standing on my right, and I grabbed his hand, and I was like, "Woo!" And he was like, be careful, bro. I'm like, what? And he goes, oh, I tore my muscle. And I'm like, oh, okay, I just injured one of our, our people. But then in that moment, I'm like, and praise God he's here because I'm believing for a healing for him today. So we got, we got done praying as a team for, for you as, as you were coming in, preparing the house. And so afterwards, I'm like, I'm believing for, for a healing. I want to pray with you. And I grabbed oil and I proclaimed just what the word of God says. And that we, we don't put our faith in the wisdom of men, but in the demonstration of the power of God. And so I, I right at the very, just even before church began, God's presence was operating. And here, here's the deal. Some of us, we come in as maybe, you know, influenced, under the influence. Everybody say that phrase, under the influence. Now, when you hear that, typically that's a bad thing. But we come under the influence of circumstance, challenge. Oh, I got this information, I got this news, or my boss told me this, or have you watched the news? And I'm telling you, that our spiritual muscle does not depend on the circumstances around us. We need to recognize as believers of Christ, my strength is in the Lord. The Bible says in him we live and in him we move and in him we have our very existence, our being. It's in him. So let me ask you this, in him, is there bad news? In him is there sorrow. In him is there, well, you know, it's kind of a 50-50 chance if I'm going to be able to have a good day or not. No, 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 no. None of that. And so let's fix our mind on him. Why do we start off with praise? What is praise? Praise is loud, loud, exuberance joy enhancing the reputation of someone or something and we didn't come to exalt a church we didn't come to exalt a team we came to exalt God so this house is full of praise to him so if you felt uncomfortable with uh, you know people shouting guess what it, it, it's not a fake thing it's a joyful thing as I was getting ready last night and I know I'm like really going on as I was getting ready last night, thinking about the day and da da da, and, and I know this sounds kind of weird, I was even thinking about what I'm going to wear. And so um, I was thinking about last weekend. I knew that I was coming in. I was determined that I was going to praise like you weren't here. I was going to praise God because He deserves my very best praise. 
And so part of me wanted to wear like a t-shirt just because I know how much I sweat. But at the same time, I'm like, no, I want to I wanna come in. And I, I felt like, you know, if you've noticed, one of the things I've been trying to do is I've been trying to like come in like representing, like I'm coming with expectation to meet with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now, I'm, I'm, that, that has nothing to do, has nothing to do with what you should wear or anything like that. But this is just something inside that's, that started happening. Okay, I'm, I'm fine with coming to church in jeans and a hoodie. I have no problem with that. But I felt like just something in me just started shifting. Like, God, I'm coming in your presence. I'm coming, I'm coming ready to meet with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I knew that if I wore, if I wore long sleeves, not even a jacket, if I wore long sleeves, I'm gonna sweat like this. So guess what? I brought two towels today. I got one for this service and I got one for the next service. Why? Because I don't want even what I wear to limit what the joy is on the inside of me. Okay, now that sounds really simple. It sounds really simple. And it may seem like, why, why does this matter? Because if we can shake off the fear of what people think, if we can shake off um, how I feel, if I could press in in the truth that we serve, listen, we serve a resurrected king. A resurrected king. We're not just coming out of religious mechanics because there's no life in that. There's no joy in religion. Religion will suck the joy out of you. And some of you, you've grown up in church or you've been a part of church for a while or maybe maybe you just felt like the fire or the passion has kind of waned away and it's just become a routine. I just, I want you to know that part of what God is doing in this body is he is shaking off religion and he's breathing in once again the joy of our salvation. Listen to that. David says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. You want to know what I was thinking about when I was worshiping and praising God? One, I was thinking about my family growing up. Now, some of you don't know this story, and I feel a little awkward saying this because I know that this is being live streamed, but, but you know what? It's part of my story. I grew up in a family where there was physical abuse, sexual abuse, drunkenness, lying, manipulation, and sexual sin. I grew up in that. I grew up, actually I found out later in my life that my mom had me, not by my dad who raised me, but by another person. And I, that, that whole journey for me personally was an incredible like supernatural thing that God did to restore that in such a quick period of time. But I'm, I'm sharing all that to say, my life could be a lot worse than what it is right now. My life does not deserve these second chances but yet God's grace and mercy was available to me. I, I don't stand here restored because of counseling, and there's nothing wrong with counseling, but I have a counselor that is above all counselors. Some of you, you've experienced, you've been a victim, a true victim of pain, abuse, heartache, shame, betrayal, and and you have found depths of healing and maybe still on that journey of healing. And can I tell you, the one who started a good work will be faithful to finish that good work. I have a lot to praise God for. I think about my marriage with my wife. We're gonna be celebrating 29 years this year. Listen, listen, you may think, well, no biggie, it's a big deal. When divorce and brokenness had been the lineage up until now, what broke that? Not me being that good, but Jesus being that good and him making my heart whole so I can be a better man for my wife. That's why I celebrate. I think about my girls. I think about my daughter, Michaela, Pastor Michaela, and God's call in her life. I think about my daughter, Jaden, who's in Arizona and what God is doing in her life. I have much to celebrate God for. I think about the finances and how God has taken out of us uh, uh, this debt and being enslaved in debt and how through the principles of truth, 
has brought us out of debt, out of the yoke of bondage. And I'm not saying that we're busting out of the seams with money, not yet, but I'm telling you that God has given us peace that passes understanding even in our finances. We got two girls right now that have gone through college debt free. That is not the normal, why? Not because I make so much money, hello, but because God is good. We have much to celebrate God for. Why would we withhold praises that only belongs to Him? Only belongs to Him. So I know, I know we're at the 941 mark and church started at 9 o'clock, but I sense even in the spirit right now, some of you are like, okay, this is the beginning. And, 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 and listen, I, I understand that and I will have grace for that. I will have patience for that. I will, but at some point we have to realize I've got to learn how to stir myself up so that when I come in, I'm not a consumer, but I'm a contributor. And I let the presence of God not just be experienced for myself, but I can help set the presence of God for somebody else. Last week, that second service, you wanna know what started it? As we were standing up here, there was a young little girl standing, actually sitting right here, right where you were sitting. Her and her mom, just like this. And it was our time of worship. And she was jumping and she was waving her hands and she was just going. And everyone else, including me, was kind of like. And I looked at that girl and I was like, go girl. And, and so we got to a point where I just, it was time for me to come up like this. And I was like, hey, I just want to thank you so much for worshiping. And all of a sudden the Lord just began doing something. And it just took everything that was planned and prepared and it just swung it here. And I'm telling you what was deposited, deposited last week was a spirit of joy. More than a outline message you need from me, you need to encounter the presence of joy. So I, I know this is supposed to be an offering time and we're, we're gonna do that. Why are you laughing? All right. Uh, but I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to have us go ahead and, and prepare for our offering. And I want you, if you can, just go ahead and get your offering envelope. I want to read a portion of scripture. Uh, this is not going to be on the screen. This is just coming to me right here. I'll, if you have your Bible, turn to Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. If you don't have a Bible, maybe slide next to somebody who does. Maybe look over their shoulder. If you don't have a Bible, we would love to make sure you do have one at the end of service. All you need to do is go to the next step there and be like, hey, I don't have a Bible. Can I get one? And they'll absolutely give you one for free. Hebrews 4. I want to read verses 1 through 3. At the very top of my Bible, there's a subheader, and the subheader says, the promise of rest. Can I just tell you another thing that's not happening in our society is rest. There's a lot of grind, there's a lot of stress, there's a lot of anxiety. Promise of rest, Hebrews 4, verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest. That's a very powerful statement. There is a promise that remains that we can enter whose rest? His rest. Let us fear, uh, excuse me. Let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed... The gospel, everybody say gospel. What is gospel? The word gospel means good news. So we could say, for indeed the good news was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard, notice this, the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Verse 2 is a very powerful verse. The good news does not activate without our faith. 
It doesn't matter who's preaching up here. It doesn't matter if they're sweating or not. It doesn't matter if they're shouting or not. The good news, and the good news is a very big good news. The good news that we hear must be received as we say, that word is mine. I, I, I'm going to profit from that word because that word is for me. If you think about that verse, the opposite would be true, that there is no benefit, there's no benefit if you don't have faith to engage it, but you can also look at it the opposite way, and there is great benefit, there is great profit when you allow your faith to say, that's what I believe right there. I'm going to hold on to that, regardless of how I feel, regardless of what it looks like. And then it goes on and says, for we who have believed do enter his rest. That's the first part of verse 3. So we who do believe, we will enter that rest. It's not a grind. It's his rest. So let's, let's just think about it this way. Giving, giving is part of the good news. And as I give joyfully, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, you should not give because you feel like your arm is being twisted. Just like you shouldn't praise. Like true praise doesn't come from a twisted arm. It has to come from within. And so even as we give, we don't give out of reluctancy. We give in faith saying, Lord, you who began this work will complete it in my life. You know the circumstances around. You, you know what, what the economy is. You know what's projected to come. But I declare, I'm not part of this economic system. I'm part of God's kingdom economics. That's what I am a part of. And so I don't give just out of the rationale of budgeting. I give out of the rationale of glory and praise to him. Out of the good news. In just a little bit, I'm going to read just some verses that I think help us with this. And, uh, and I truly believe that God is going to ignite something in us and restore to us that joy. And so I'm going to have, if you've got your envelopes ready, I know some of you give um, electronically and that's okay. But I'm going to have our team go ahead. They're going to come forward and we're going to pass the offering buckets. In just a second, I want to pray and then they're going to pass them. And if you are new here, you're kind of like, okay, this is maybe different than what I'm used to and that's okay. We welcome you here. I want you to know that we're not here just to check a box. We're here to really allow God to do something inside of us. And if you feel comfortable and you would be willing to drop your connect card in, you can do that as offering buckets come, all right? But I want us, if we can, just go ahead and lift up our offering envelopes. And I want us to bring them before the Lord, just saying, Lord, in faith, we're giving. I want you to think about this. I'm giving in faith. Not just out of routine. I'm giving in faith. What are you believing God for? When we give in faith, it profits us. It will strengthen us. Some of you have been hit with unforeseen um, expenses. It could be vehicle issues. It could be uh, things going on in the family that you're like, man, we didn't plan for this. It's okay. God saw the beginning from the end, and he has a way to get that resource in your hand. I believe that. So I want us to pray blessing on this, all right, in faith. So go ahead and raise that up. Father, today I thank you that as we give, we're not giving brainlessly mindlessly without affection we're giving in joy and in expectation we give in faith we know lord god that when we hear your good news about how you you are the one who provides all of our needs Lord guys so we don't look at the circumstances and hold back we see the circumstances and in faith we say and my god shall meet all those needs and it profits us. It does something in us. So, God, I thank you for that. I pray that as we give in expectation, as we give in joy, as we give, Lord God, in obedience, Lord God, we know that you will show yourself faithful and we will enter a rest. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may go ahead and receive. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, silence the bones of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. Cause you have no
us to open our eyes and open our hearts to be aware, to respond, and to receive. But God, what you desire to impart to us today. God, I thank you that today is a day of strength. I thank you that today is a day of victory. I thank you that today is a day of healing and salvation. God, I thank you that today you're lifting, lifting the countenance of your sons and daughters. Lord God, that you're throwing wide open the windows of heaven and you're saying, come home. You're saying, find rest for your soul. And God, all these things we recognize are available to us as we hear what your spirit is saying and we have the faith to say, that is mine today. So help us, teach us to receive today. Father, we proclaim that your word that we're going to read is good. It's good seed. There's nothing wrong with it. It's still the way, the truth, and the life. It still refreshes. It still strengthens. It still corrects. It still exhorts. It still heals. So, Father, today as we go to your word, we highly esteem it. And if there's anything within us, mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, financially, relationally, Lord God, we will bring it in the submission of the authority of your word. And in doing so, Lord God, we come into the alignment of your blessing and we recognize, Lord God, you withhold no good thing from us. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. You say amen. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. I want to read, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 3. We're going to do quite a bit of reading today. You know, sometimes um, in, in the aspect of preaching and teaching, we can assume, and I think sometimes falsely, I think there is a gift, I think there's the anointing to teach and to preach, and I don't want to minimize that. But how many of you guys know that the Word itself has the ability to change our lives? I mean, just reading the Word. And so I want to do some reading today in, in Acts chapter 3. We've been in a series on the Holy Spirit and I think this is, what, week 16 or something. 
And over the last few weeks, we've been keeping this, this same focus, this same idea, because sometimes we need to hear it more than once. You know what I'm saying? We need to hear it more than once, and especially this, this simple big idea that I, that I believe God has for us is we need to get in the flow of the Holy Spirit and stay in the flow of the Holy Spirit. And for some of us, who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit is all about, <clears throat> these are new things. These are growing things. And if you've missed anything, you can go back and you can listen or watch online uh, or via the app. Uh, but today, I just believe that there's still, the Word of God has enough to be able to sort through your questions and your, your situation to be able to penetrate your heart and breathe life into those areas that need life. Bring reassurance to those areas that you've been holding on to. And so I want to read today about the life of Peter. And we started this last week. But we're going to read Acts chapter 3. And we're actually going to read through into chapter 4. And uh, I just want you uh, to just listen, not with your head, but listen with your spirit. As we read in your Bible. This is one of the reasons why I like a written or, or analog Bible is you have the ability to underline a specific word and to, to write a little note in it. Because what you are writing isn't just what some, someone said, but you're writing down what the Holy Spirit is nudging within your spirit. Nudging in your heart. And so in Acts chapter 3, starting with verse 1, it says, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in 3 o'clock prayer service. And as they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg for uh, beg from the people going into the temple. Uh, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. I don't have any silver or gold for you. But I'll give you what I have. I love that statement. It, it paints a picture that what God has deposited in us is tangible and it can be imparted. What I have, I can give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Now, if you were to ask this man prior to this day, hey, what would you rather have, silver and gold or the ability to walk? I believe that he would say the ability to walk because in his ability to walk and his ability in his healing, he would then be able to find work to get silver and gold. You know, the enemy many times will impact one area of our life and it stunts other areas of our life. And so what you may think you need may not be that thing. You actually might need deliverance, freedom, and healing in another area so that it releases ability in that other area. Goes on and says, the man looked at them eagerly, verse five, expecting some money, but Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, as he did, say that with me, as he did. So he didn't wait for his legs to get strong to do this. His legs were still weak. His legs still weren't working. Peter reached out. He gave a word. I'm going to give to you what I have. I don't have silver and gold, but I can give you what I have. And that is found in, the G in Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. Let's not be confused. This is not some other Jesus. This is Jesus the Christ, Jesus the anointed one. He was sitting over there, I don't know, he transfigured, I have no idea. But um, He said, but what I have, I'm going to give you. And as he reached out, as he reached out and did what seemed to be impossible, which many of us, we want to see the leg strong and then we say get up. We want to see the change happen before we move. But how God operates many times is, no, I want you to believe you can move before anything really feels like it's happening. 
It says that as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then, walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. Verse 9. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. I love that. I love not just the part that they saw him walking, but I love the part that probably drew their eyes to this man who started walking, and it was they heard him praising God. I, I just think there's something powerful about how we praise. How we praise brings attention to what God has done. So they saw this man Walking, heard him praising God, verse 10. And when they realized he was the lame beggar that had, uh, they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John, verse 12. Peter saw his opportunity. <laughs> I love that statement. For some of us, we are missing opportunities all around us. Peter saw his opportunity, and he addressed the crowd. People of Israel, he said. What is so surprising about this? Now, that sounds kind of belittling, right? But notice Peter's faith. He expected those types of things to happen. Now, for many of us, these types of supernatural, miraculous, wondrous things are not a regular occurrence. I know even in this room, there are people that have been believing, holding on to, maybe even feel like there's a disappointment. Like that breakthrough, that miraculous, that thing did not happen. As I read this text, and even as I talk now, I know that, that that tension is and seems very, very real, maybe even painful. There's many things that I think we could dive into, we can have conversation on, but something that I, and then this is what I'm choosing, please understand this, this is what I'm choosing. It may feel like an overly simplified statement, but this is what I'm choosing. I'm choosing to believe that I'm not going to let my past experiences determine what I still believe God is able to do today. I choose that. Now, some may say, well, that leaves some, you know, that doesn't answer the questions. It's not mine to answer. But I want to choose where I'm going to position my heart, how I'm going to look at Scripture, and I'm going to believe that not only... Can God, that God still does miraculous things. But I can position myself to expect God to do miraculous things. I even expect God can do and will do. I want to be very clear with this. I expect God will do miraculous things through me. I had a board meeting yesterday as we were you know, it's a monthly thing, and we were talking about different things, and God just kind of, just even in, in our, our, our meeting, God just began stirring us, and it just kind of took, again, took on a, kind of a, a pathway of its own. And as we were sharing some things that we felt like the Lord was just speaking to us and depositing in us, and, and personally as well as for the house, I, I made a statement to them. I didn't plan on making it today, but I'm going to make it today. I'm expecting that miracles, signs, and wonders are going to become a regular occurrence here at Faith Family Church. God is doing something. And there is an acceleration and there is a momentum that's happening with this. Now, we can either choose to be spectators of it, or we can choose to be participators of it. And I, I will say, I think praise is the beginning of participation. So here we have this incredible account where Peter and this lame man, and this lame man that is now healed, is causing a ruckus within the temple. 
And I, I want you, as we're going to continue to read, I want you to hear the boldness of Peter. And, and here's what I want to remind us of. Peter was not this bold prior to the Holy Spirit. Peter was not this bold prior to the Holy Spirit. It wasn't like Peter had to then get stirred up again to be bold. He learned from that moment back in Acts chapter 2 how to stay in the flow. There was no worship team playing behind him. There was no message that was being preached. As he was approaching the temple to go to prayer, he saw this man. He looked at him. This man looked back. He asked, and in that moment, Peter and John knew this is a moment to demonstrate God's power. He didn't say, well, you know, I, I've got to go prepare, you know, like for me, I've got to go prepare on the side, and I've got to come in, get ready to prepare the word and share the word. Like, I'm even learning. Like, I was over there, and I was like, Lord, I don't want to walk in a grind. I want to walk in your joy. So I, I, I have to shake off the weight of a personal, like, okay, I've got to deliver this. I, had to sh I have to shake that off. Now, it's a joy to share, it's a privilege to share, but it's not about me, uh, I, I got to make sure they get this. I can relax in the impartation of what God is doing. And so Peter, he's been staying in this flow, the flow of the Holy Spirit. He saw the opportunity. He's like, why are you surprised about this? And why stare at us? This is verse 12. And why stare at us as though uh, we had made this man uh, walk by our own power or godliness. Verse 13, for it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Say that with me. It is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, we were singing that, that third song talking about uh, the generations. Proclaim it to your sons. Proclaim it to your daughters. Listen, I believe it's time that our sons and our daughters and our grandchildren see the presence of God. We need to proclaim this. We need to demonstrate this. And so he goes to kind of the, um, like, these, these incredible uh, godly heroes of the faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he's saying it's the same God who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by this. No, again, notice the language. This is the same Jesus who you handed over and rejected before Pilate, despite Pilate's decision to release him. You rejected this holy, righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this fact. Now, part of the reason why I'm, I'm reading this in the New Living, uh, the, the NLT, the New Living Translation, is partially because of the ease of readability. But also, I love how many exclamation points are in here. So I just, when I see them, I just see enthusiasm and, and, and proclamation, right? And so, and, and he's saying this in a place where the religious leaders were the ones who executed the murder of Jesus. So he's just not, not just talking to church folk. He's recognizing he's standing among the very presence of those that had the authority that plotted the scheme to kill Jesus. So this is not a safe time for him. This is a, this is a dangerous time. Verse 16, through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. How was he healed? Through faith in the name of Jesus. And you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. Friends, I realize that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance, but God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. Verse 19, now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. Man, verse 20, I love verse 20. Do you know what happens when we come and we say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for my sin. Forgive me for what I've done. Forgive me for ignoring. Forgive me for walking in religion. Forgive me for, for recognizing that I've been trying to do this in my own strength, but now I recognize I need to walk hand in hand in your presence. I love verse 20 so much, I'm going to read it again. Then times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. And he will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah. 
verse 21. For he must remain in heaven until the time, the final restoration of all things, as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. Listen carefully to everything he tells you. Then Moses said, anyone who will not listen to the prophet will be completely cut off from God's people. So he's just reiterating again how God over the years was proclaiming about who Jesus is and the promise of who he was. He was the Messiah. I want to jump down now to... Um, uh, verse, uh, chapter 4, if we can go to chapter 4, verse 1. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus there is a resurrection of the dead. I want you to underline verse 2. Because what religion wants to do is minimize, reduce to just a story that we talk about once a year of the resurrection. When we think about actually what does it mean to get in the flow and stay in the flow by the Holy Spirit is to recognize, and I said this verse earlier, I believe it's in Acts 17 where it talks about in him we live and in him we move and in him we have our being. The thing that we recognize even as we come into worship today and as we were singing, we were singing that part of the song, I don't know if you, if you caught it, death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and shame. The heavens are roaring. The praise of his glory. For you have been raised to life again. You have no rival. You have no equal. Come on, this is the story of the saints. So when you, when you keep in mind, listen, when we keep in mind that we have a resurrected king, it does something to acclimate or to put into perspective what we're actually facing. We are facing what in our natural eyes looks to be impossible. But through the resurrection of Christ, we know that nothing is impossible. So this has to stir us and go, where is our faith on this? What, what, what do we truly believe? And I, I, just, I just want to kind of pause and meddle right now. Some of you, you believe the report of the doctor. You repeat, believe the report of, of the news media. You believe your own voice more than maybe you believe what the Word of God says. And you may say things like, well, Pastor, you don't understand. You know, if, if, you know I get it because I've been there. And part of what has been untangling in me, and I'm, I'm saying this with great humility and at the same time great boldness, even in the midst of what I feel sometimes is uncertain. I have seen and I am witnessing afresh and anew the power and presence of God do in me and through me, in my wife and through my wife, through others within this body, people outside this body, where God is demonstrating his power in such a clear way that we go, it is not anything else or anyone else that can take credit. It is only Jesus Christ himself who can take all the credit for these great exploits that God is doing. My confidence is not in me. My confidence is in Christ in me. And my confidence is that I'm in Christ. I'm confident of Christ in me. And I'm confident of me being in Christ. Peter and John, they were with Christ for three years. They heard the teachings. They participated in miracles. Peter himself, I mean, he was told that he was going to deny Christ three times. And he was like, no, 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 you don't understand. I, I, I'm going to die for you. And he's like, no, you're, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. 
What changed for Peter? Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit was poured out. Here we are in Acts 3, and you can go on and read throughout the book of Acts, and you're going to see that Peter, Peter knew that there was a difference in him because of the Holy Spirit, and he chose to remain in the flow of the Spirit. For some of us, we do the hokey pokey with God. Can we be honest with that? Man, okay, right now it's easy to jump in the water. The water's great. You're, you're like, people are splashing, people are praising God, people are amening. You sense it, your heart's being stirred. You're like, okay, I'm in. And you jump in and you're like, okay, this isn't so bad, this is good. And then we dismiss, and then your, your Super Bowl team loses. And then, and then uh, you, you figure out, you know, that things at work are, are changing and you're not ready for that. And then you get news about this or that. And all of a sudden you're like, ah, oh, and you found yourself, you've jumped out of the flow. You got to stay in the flow. Get in the flow and stay in the flow. What, what does that mean? Stay in fellowship. Stay mindful. Remember. Proclaim. Stir up. Get together with the other Peters and Johns and have fellowship that says, hey, 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 we see this, but nope, let's stay in the flow. And for some of us, or maybe even many of us, we're willing to jump in because people right now are jumping in, but when this is all said and done and you go your own way, you have nobody to jump in with. Now, I will say, that doesn't need to be a problem because you can still choose to jump in. You choose to remain in. But I do know it's easier to remain in when you're kind of like, I, I, don't, I don't know about this. And someone's like, no, 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 let's stay in. Let's immerse ourselves in this. Let's continue that helps. We don't stay in it because we're not in it. And, and I, I'm not saying any of this to shame. I'm just trying to give a practical understanding of what does it mean to remain? What does it mean to abide? John chapter 10. It is his presence. I, I have been... In the last, I'd say, six months, I have been stirred. I have been, um, I have been, in a very holy way, disturbed and dissatisfied with my walk with the Lord and my leadership as a pastor to this church. Now, I'm not discrediting anything that has happened. But what's being stirred and what's being disturbed and what's being dissatisfied is, is the faith that's stirring up within me that says, and there is much more that God wants to do. I don't want to settle here. I don't want to cheat myself. I don't want to cheat us from the fullness of what God has for us. Peter and John, as they are ministering, these religious leaders come in. So we're in chapter four, and I, I want us to see how this takes on another weight because this is what these leaders represent. They represent religious attitude, religious spirit to try to keep us small. So in reading this, verse one, while Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus, there is a resurrection of the dead. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, put them in jail until morning. So the circumstances weren't good. But many of the people who heard the message believed it, so the number of men who believed now totaled about 5,000. Like, I, I want that to get into you for a second. The boldness of Peter, who was staying in the flow, to proclaim boldly who Jesus Christ was, resulted in a harvest. Even though that harvest led him into a jail. Which you have to think about what mind monsters Peter and John were maybe going through. Okay, these same people that arrested Jesus, beat him beyond recognition, crucified him on the cross, sealed the tomb are the same people who now have arrested us. What is our fate? That could have been a very real thought process. 
but they chose to stay in the flow. We go on and read, it says in verse 5, the next day, the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. So these are all the who's who's. Ananias, the high priest, was there along with uh, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other relatives of the high priests. They brought in the two disciples and demanded, notice their question, by what power or in whose name have you done this? They understood there had to be an authority. And something the enemy wants us to think about or not think about is that we have an authority. We have been given, delegated, assigned, appointed by God himself and anointed for the task to proclaim the gospel. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. So, so here's what I want you to see. Verse 8 says that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. When was he originally filled with the Holy Spirit? Acts 2. So I want you to see that the filling of the Holy Spirit is not just something we do a one and done. It's something we recognize. We stay in the flow. So it says, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of a people, we are being questioned today because we have done a good deed for a crippled man. Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. Okay, remember who he's talking to. For Jesus is the one who referred to his scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This uh, excuse me, there is salvation in no one else, exclamation point. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Notice, for they could see that they were what? They were ordinary, not scholarly, not educated, not any of the other classifications, but these were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. So this was not just stirred up because they, they did a sermon prep. This was all stirred up because the Holy Spirit, who was faithful to guide and lead us in truth. Listen, one of the things about being in the flow and staying in the flow is that you have the ability to be ready in season and out of season. So when we feel like we have to rely on our intellect and on our study and on our preparation, what we're saying is, I'm going to rely on me. It, it could be, and I, I, I'm not trying to make a doctrine out of this, but it could be that some of the very things that you want to depend on, God is removing out of the nest to say, no, you just got to rely on me. The people that you want to hold on to, the comforts that you want to hold on to, the, the, the position and the title that you want to hold on to. No, 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 no. You can't rely on those things. The only way that people can be saved, the only way that people can experience the power and presence of God is by abiding and staying in the flow of Jesus Christ. So they were ordinary men, untrained. Um, in the scriptures, they also recognized that these men who had been with Jesus... I want you to think about this. The council saw the same spirit on Peter and John as they saw on Jesus. I want that to be said about me. That is going to be said about me. That the same spirit, the same anointing, the same power, the same boldness... The same effectiveness that Jesus had while he walked this earth can be how I walk on this earth. Now you may say, well, are, are you saying you're, you're equal to Jesus? No, I'm just saying what he said in John 14. What did he say in John 14? Hey, the works that you saw me do, you will do, and even greater things will you do. 
because I go to my Father who is in heaven, which he was implying, because I go away and I'm giving you the Holy Spirit, you can do these things. Now, guess what? Most of us, we don't, we don't even dream or think about putting ourselves in that category. We don't. And, and, and humanly, rightfully so. Humanly, rightfully so. But according to Scripture, according to the authority that we have been given in His name, not that we have usurped, not that we're striving for, but that was given to us, go. Do the things, proclaim the things, teach the things that I have told you and modeled to you. Can, can we just stop there? In this room, some of you are like, <laughs> for real? And yeah, I, I know how that can sound. It may feel unrealistic, but that's where our faith has got to grow to. Can I get an amen on this? Amen. Verse 16. What should we do with these men, they asked each other. We can't deny that they have performed a miraculous sign, and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. But to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, notice that. To keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak in anyone, uh, to anyone in Jesus' name again. So they called the apostles back and, the commander, uh, and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John said, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. The council then threatened them further. But they finally let them go because they did not know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone was praising God for this miraculous sign, the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. All the enemy has is threats. What we have is his presence, his power, and his covenant. God on our side. I want us to read, and I'm going to have the team go ahead and come up. It's 1031. I want us to, to lean in and listen to this part, because here, here's the question we have to ask. What would we have done if we were these people? And, and this is what I'm going to ask you to do. I, I know that they're going to come up. I don't want you to get distracted. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change your posture to reset your focus, all right? So I'm going to ask everyone, if you can, go ahead and stand up real quick. I asked the question, what would you have, what would we have done? What would you have done? What would I have done? Now, what I'm going to say, I know, can feel very polarizing. It can be very sensitive. This is me. This is my story. This is my journey. And this is unfolding in real time for me. I don't think we as a people, not just here in Washington, but even nationally and even globally. I don't know how many of us, when we look back at 2020, and we look at the things that we had to discern and navigate. I'm speaking about me. I would say, and, I, and I've shared this before, so this is not new, but it's reiterating this. This is because this is where God had to begin doing a new work in me. I recognize I did not have the discernment. I did not have the boldness. I was out of the flow. I, I had no awareness of what was going on around us. As I caught wind and things around were like, okay, here's the information. This is what they're saying to us. I, I kind of was stuck flat-footed. Now, I know many have said, man, you just, you just navigated with the, what you knew. I understand that. And I, and, I, and I can acknowledge that. And I look back and I go, if and or when that happens again, 
what would I do differently? That, that's what I have to answer. And when I read this, I go, I pray that I can, I can walk like Peter and John did in that moment. So knowing the things that we know now, looking at how we navigated then or maybe what God is showing us now, I want us to read these last parts of Acts 4 and think about that spirit that was stirred up inside of them. It says in verse 23, as soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. When they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voice together to pray to God. Notice their prayer. O sovereign Lord, creator of the heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, Why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord, against his Messiah. Verse 29. And now, O Lord, hear their threats. Give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. In other words, what they're praying is, Lord, I know that we got in trouble for doing what we did, but help us do more. Help us do more. Help us be more bold. Help us proclaim it a little louder, a little more clear. Don't let us shrink back from this moment. Verse 31, and after this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. So now a second time we see, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're like, well, what does it mean to be in the flow and stay in the flow? You are positioning yourself because every new thing that the Lord wants to do, he's going to give you his spirit to do it. To give you that courage, that wisdom, that spirit of resolute, to honor God, to do that. Now, there is, there is much to be said about all of this text. But here we are, 9 o'clock in February 2024, and here's what I believe that God wants to do in us. I believe he, he wants us to say, Lord, considering everything that's going around, I need your boldness to be your witness. I am not here to champion any political party. I believe both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party both have corrupt issues on either side of it. My hope is not in who's going to be in the White House this next election. My confidence is going to be in the one that I put my eternal faith in, and that is Jesus Christ. And I want, listen, I want to live that in such a way that even in this political climate or in the things that we will face in any aspect, school, work, family, all these things, that I will be willing to be a voice of the gospel of Jesus Christ and come what may. I may go in jail. I may get persecuted. I may be released from a job. I may be disowned by some family. I do not care. I would rather stand in the confidence of who Jesus Christ is than anything else. And I could not say that. I could not genuinely say that. I would want to have said that, but I could not have said that back in 2020 because my actions proved it. My actions proved it. And as I did back then, I say it to you now, as your pastor of this church, forgive me for not being in the flow and staying in the flow of the Holy Spirit. I know I'm forgiven. I know that God has given me a brand new slate, and I am so grateful for that. And I will not lead this season of my life the way that I did then. I will not re lead in religion. I will not lead passive. I will lead leaning in to the Spirit of God, hearing His voice, and believing that the same Jesus who raised Christ from the dead is the same presence that works in me and through this church and wants to do greater things through us for this region. I will believe that. I don't know how it's all going to be done, but it starts by just re remaining in Him. 
So here's the altar call. If you have been living your faith in a form of godliness, but denying the resurrection power. If you have been walking in more religion, then you have boldness of the resurrected power of God. And you want that to be different. You want to repent of that. And you want to say, I know I want to live with that boldness. I want to live with that spirit of boldness in me. If that's you, just right where you're at, I'm going to have you raise your hand. One, two, three, raise your hand if that's you. Keep that hand up. Keep that hand up. Keep that hand up. Some of you want to clap. You're like, what do we do? Yeah, you can clap. You can do that. That's great. That's fine. But here's what I know. I know that we all have to go through an entanglement. And the only way to get untangled is through repentance. Okay? That, that's the beginning. Then the other part is letting the, 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 the washing of the word work in us. Allow the spirit of truth to guide and direct us. To walk in fellowship with one another, rightfully dividing the word of truth. And so please know this is not about just trying to like stir up an emotionalism. This is about saying, God, we, we want to understand what does it mean to walk and to live in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And so those hands that are up, thank you for that. And I want to pray this prayer with you because that's my prayer too. That I would walk in resurrection power that I will not shrink back, that I will not deny who laid it all down for me. And that come what may, I will have wisdom and discernment, but I will also be bold as a lion to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in these situations. So Father, right now, our lives right here are not our own. We've been bought with a price. And your word says that we are then to honor and glorify you in our body, in every aspect of our life. Father, the prayer that these believers prayed after this tongue lashing and these threats, they said, Lord, consider their threats, consider what they said, and now give us your boldness, give us your spirit. Increase in us for such a time as this because we know that we are not wrestling against flesh and blood. It's not just even the religious leaders. It's about the principalities of this world that wants to, to, to let that antichrist spirit just water down and to neuter the power of the gospel. But we declare that the power of the gospel is in Jesus Christ, the resurrected king. And that same resurrection of Christ, that spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in me. And I wanna live with that boldness. I wanna live with that passion. I wanna live with that fire. God, this doesn't give me license to be rude and to be a jerk, but it gives me an understanding of what I stand for. I will stand for your kingdom. I will stand for your righteousness. But God, I thank you for that. And in these moments where God, as, as, as we are wrapping this up, God, I just thank you that you are gonna shake our world. It said there that that place that they were gathered shook. Lord, I pray that you would do a shaking in this house. Lord God, that it would shake off, Lord God, shake off those things that hinder, those things that bind, the sin, the entanglements, Lord God, and that we would run our race with perseverance, what you marked out for us. So Father, I thank you for that. And we receive this, and we embrace this, that as we walk out from here, Lord God, we recognize that I am in Christ and Christ is in me. In Jesus' name. In a moment like this, there's so much that I know my heart just fires with. I want you to hear this. I love you. I love what God has called us to. And I want to just say thank you for letting me be vulnerable, letting me be honest. And I'm so glad for what the Lord is doing in my life. And I pray that you will come to a place even where you just go, God, I, I love what you're doing in my life. And I want to encourage you, take the time to maybe write down or just sit with the Lord and be like, God, I just want to say thank you. It does something. And so I know you're going to be dismissed. 
But I, I want you to know, like, if, you, if there's anything we can pray with you about, if you need a Bible, if you want to know, man, how do I get bold and take my next step of water baptism, whatever it may be, we have our next step areas in the back. And, and we put them in the back now because as you go out, I want you to feel like, okay, that's a convenient stop. You can go there and someone's going to pray with you or encourage you. But I know that what God is beginning to do, he's going to keep doing more and more and more in our life. Amen. Amen. You guys, I pray blessing on you. You are dismissed. Have an incredible, incredible day.